Welcome to this edition of Access Together. These shows are made possible through the combined efforts of Shelby County Schools and GHS-TV. The shows are hosted by the members of the community and utilize the staff and facilities of Germantown High School. If you would like to watch our live stream or get more information about these shows, log on to our website, ghstv.org. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the following presentation. Welcome to Let's Talk Money. My name is Kelly Bolton and this is my co-host Harvey Cook. We thank you for tuning in. Today we have the distinct pleasure of hosting the community's foremost business and community leaders. Our next guest helps people face one of life's few certainties and that is taxes. As the director of estate and gift tax services at Reynolds Bone and Greaseback, Lorena, Lorinda Ingram navigates the ever-changing and complex world of taxes. We're honored to have Lorinda as our guest as she shares with us her insight and guidance on this important subject. So without further ado, let's, wel let's welcome Lorinda to our program. Lorinda, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Good. You'll have to forgive me. I'm kind of losing my voice as I was stumbling through the introduction. Oh. I think allergies are getting to me. Um, can you share with the viewers what inspired you to get into the tax industry? Well, that's interesting. Um, I, I went to law school at Vanderbilt and I happened to take a tax class and that's when I fell in love with taxes. Um, you it, may be the only person I that ever be, says they're in love with taxes. <laughs> that, that may be true. <laughs> and then um, I wasn't sure what area I wanted to go into. I do have an accounting degree. Um, I also have an MBA from Vanderbilt. Um, but what I noticed is if, if you know an area that a lot of people have a, ment a mental block on, then you can help people. And that's the motivator for people that are in this industry. And it, I specialize in the area of estate and gift and trust tax services. And so I work with a lot of people, um, some wealthy, some not so wealthy, through the stressful situation of having lost someone in their family. Sometimes that's the person that knew all the pieces. And so it's, it's helping people it, that's really the motivator. That's interesting. Well, it sounds like you've got plenty of education. You've got your accounting degree, your MBA, and your law degree. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And I'm a CPA. <laughs> and you're a CPA. So. Wow. So, um, you know, I, I've known a lot of people to be one or the other, but to have all of those is quite, quite um, inspiring. So when you're working with clients, um, what kind of things, give us some examples of things, real life examples that you might help them with. Um, well, there's been a lot of changes in, in the area. Now there's more and more focus on income tax planning because the um, Tennessee eliminated its, in, its inheritance tax and the federal exemption on either lifetime gifting or giving after death has been increased to almost five and a half million. And plus, between spouses, they have something called portability. So an un a spouse's unused exemption can be basically transferred to the surviving spouse. So you're looking at people, a couple that has $11 million, not having an estate tax problem. So wow. there, there are ways that, that focusing on the income tax side that we can help families save money. So what you're saying is now that you can have a lot more money and a and not have to pay estate taxes, yes. the real focus is trying to save that current income tax. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And are there, uh, Lorraine, are, th are there other types of taxes other than what you just talked about that individuals have to deal with? Well, um, Tennessee has sales and use tax. Right. So we have, we have clients that, that need some guidance on that. Um, but the main ones that we help with are the income taxes and the transfer taxes. The, either estate or gift taxes. Right. We, we have a lot, we have a, I think a fairly large sales tax. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any, any, uh, any uh, strategies where you might be able to, to alleviate some of that? 
there's, there's really not. If you're going to follow the letter of the law, if you, say, bought something out of state and brought it into Tennessee, you would trigger use tax. You would have a filing. Um, sort of like people used to get an email notice from Amazon detailing their Amazon purchases that had not been subject to Tennessee sales tax. So if you're going to follow the law, really there's not a lot you can do to get out of the sales and use tax. Interesting. And obviously capital gains, we hear about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and part of the planning is, with there's a lot of planning that can be done with capital gains. There's a basis step up that happens at death. So if someone were thinking about making, um, say, deathbed gifts, they wouldn't want to make that with capital gain property, say appreciated stock. They would want to use cash if they were going to make a deathbed gift. If they're still holding that appreciated stock at death, the date of death value becomes the new tax basis in the hands of people that receive that stock. So kind of just to recap, if, if I'm following you, obviously we have sales tax that mm -hmm. you can't really avoid if you're going to buy things, so that you Correct. can't strategize. There's income tax, tax you pay on your income, and there's obviously some ways to, to save income tax, which we'll talk about. Estate tax, which is due at death. Mm -hmm. um, use sales and use the use portion of the tax, which is a different tax. Mm -hmm. And then gift tax, which has been eliminated in Tennessee if you give somebody gifts. Yes. Okay. Now, let's talk and we'll kind of dive back into some of these things in more detail, but if you're new starting out your career versus somebody that's further into their career or approaching retirement, um, let's take the person that's starting out their career. Would there be any anything you would advise them to do to try to minimize taxes from, from the beginning? Um, utilize the mechanisms to save for retirement. If where they work has a 401k plan, mm -hmm. um, if, if they can use uh, IRAs, de depending on where they work, there will be a type of retirement plan that would be appropriate. And it, certainly if an employer offers matching on a, a 401k contribution, that's something to take advantage of and to get in the habit of savings. So if you, let's say you make, um, $20,000 and you defer 10% of your income, so you're deferring $2,000, mm -hmm. well, that $2,000, you don't pay taxes on it. Now, instead right. of paying 20 on, on 20, you pay taxes on 18, correct? Mm -hmm. So you've saved that tax and then there's the match, which mm -hmm. is um, and obviously an added benefit. So the kind of the government's helping you by not taxing you and you're getting the match. Right. Now, if it's someone that's say they're just starting out or say it's um, maybe a high school student that has some earnings and they can put money in a retirement plan, they would probably want to use a Roth. Because if you look at your tax brackets, um, one thing to look at is do you think when you pull the money out you would be in a higher bracket than you are now? And if you're a high school student or a college student and maybe you don't have a lot of earnings but you are able to save some in a retirement account, if you put it in a Roth, IRA, when that money comes out, say you're in your 60s or 70s, then it would be exempt from tax then. Um, okay. That so, makes a lot so of sense. So if you think about tax brackets, mm -hmm. right. like tax bracket plan, that's why I said a lot of a lot of things now come come down to income planning, income tax planning, and that is something that we can help people with. Okay. Well, they're they're signaling that I've got to pause for just a short break. But when we return, we will continue our informative discussion with Miss Lorinda Ingram. So please stay tuned. I wish I was in school. If only I had a math test today. I'll stay after class. I'll clean the chalkboard. I wish I was in school. School ends, but free lunches for your kids don't have to. Find your local food bank at feedingamerica.org slash summer meals for help. Hello, and welcome to Cable Queens. The academic Do you know how incredible it is to work at a TV station in high school? GHS TV is a student-run television station. There's so many things you can do here at GHS TV. You can be in front or behind the camera or both. You have that opportunity. There are no limits. Well, we have sports and we have news and we have entertainment. So the students here get a well-rounded view of what it's like to be in the TV field. It's 
my life. It's what I want to do. From all of us here at GHS TV, thanks for starting your morning with us. For more information about the Kappa program, visit GHSKappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Let's Talk Money. If you're just tuning in, I'm Kelly Bolton and this is my co-host, Harvey Cook. Today we've been talking with Lorinda Ingram. She is in charge of estate and gift taxes as a director with Reynolds Bone and Griesbeck. She's sharing with us her management strategies for saving taxes. So. Thank you so much for, for staying with us. Um, we could probably have a series of shows on taxes, so we're trying to like cram everything in here together. And before um, we took a break, we were talking about somebody in their early stages of employment. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to ask you about the person that's retired. They can't save in a 401k because they have no job. So what can they do when they're in that income distribution phase and they're being forced to take money out of, say, their retirement plan because now they're 70 and a half and they have to, or they're retired and they need the money. Is there anything they can do to save taxes? Well, um, a lot of times with retired people, when we look at their income taxes, there may not be the same type of opportunities that there are when they're in their earning years. Um, one thing that some people can do is they can bunch their itemized deductions into a particular year. Mm -hmm. So they may make their, what they're planning to give to their church the next year, they may make that in December and then have a low giving year and have a higher giving year. In the low giving year, they could um, use the standard deduction. They could um, possibly prepay some of their real estate taxes. So, so the years that they use the itemized deduction, they can make that larger to help save money. So then every other year they're picking up a standard deduction. Yes. So every other year that's pretty significant savings. So that's almost like a, a free deduction yes. in a way. Um, something else that they can do if they are thinking about giving, um, like a, a significant charitable gift, they could give appreciated stock so that they don't have to pay the tax on that gain, but yet they get the deduction for the fair market value of the stock that they give to charity. They could use a donor advised fund to help bunch um, the charitable giving into one year. They could put in stock into a donor advised fund and then direct the fund manager to make distributions during that next year. But they take their the low deduction. Year. But take the whole deduction the year they fund that donor advised fund. Yes. And then if, they're, if they have some assets that produce income and they're planning to make any gifts to, to family members, maybe. Um, for, for whatever reason, but maybe those family members are in lower tax brackets, they could give the income producing property, whether stock or possibly rental property, they could give to someone that then when the income comes in, they're in a lower bracket. And what about the benefit of someone who is taking distributions from their retirement account and gives it straight to charity? That's available once someone reaches 70 and a half. It's only available for IRAs. Mm -hmm. It's not available for 401ks. Mm -hmm. So if, if they've retired and they still have money with a former employer, they would need to roll that money into an IRA from the 401k mm -hmm. first. They could give up to $100,000 directly to charity. Um, they just could not give that to a donor advised fund. It would need to be a direct gift to charity. So they get the full write-off even if through itemizing they would not because yes. well, it's not necessarily a write-off but it just doesn't hit their income. Right, it doesn't hit their income and there's some things that when you look at itemized deductions that get reduced based on what your adjusted gross income is, mm -hmm. medical expenses, um, what they call miscellaneous itemized deductions. So if you're not picking up that income on page one of your federal return, um, the IRA distribution mm -hmm. that went directly to charity, then, then that lowers those things that are, those haircuts, so to speak, that are based on um, the, the level of adjusted gross income. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Miranda, uh, people say that in Memphis we're the largest city in Mississippi <laughs> or right on the border. Uh, what's the difference between the taxes in Tennessee and Mississippi? Are, are there differences? There are differences. Um, Tennessee, 
only for individuals. Tennessee only has a tax on certain interest and dividend income, and that tax is being phased out. It's, it's lowering by 1% each year. This year, the tax rate is 4%, and it will be declining by one each year. So in about four years, we won't have an income tax in Tennessee at all, mm -hmm. which will make Tennessee very attractive for retirees and everybody else right. <laughs> that, that has investment income. So that's, that's going to be a big difference, an even bigger difference between Tennessee and Mississippi. Mississippi has, they basically start with the type things that are on your federal return. So Tennessee's never had a, an income tax on pension income, social security income, IRA income, rental income on, for individuals. That's a pretty big savings. I hear people sometimes talk about moving states to save money in taxes. And mm -hmm. I think before I spend all that money to move, I think I'd consult with somebody <laughs> like you to see if you're going to be saving enough money. Now, I, I know when we met, you talked to me about what kind of inspired you. I think you were thrown into this role working on an estate of a family member. And I'd love to hear about that and then talk about some of the tools that are used for estate planning because people throw things around like power of attorney, wills, living will, trust, that sort of thing. Well, what you're right. There, there was an, a family event of what basically sort of threw me into this area. Um, I had a great aunt that lived here in Memphis. She was a widow. She had never had any children. And I was the only family member in Memphis. So she did not have a durable power of attorney. And she had a stroke. So someone had to take steps to be able to pay hospital bills and look after her affairs. And because she did not have a durable power of attorney, we had to go through what is called a conservatorship. So you basically uh, yeah. go to probate court and you have to be appointed. Um, you have to do accountings. There has to be um, an attorney, uh, a practicing, I'm not a practicing attorney. There has to be a practicing attorney involved to represent you in probate. Um, they have to appoint what's called a guardian ad litem to make sure you're not just in there trying to get control of someone's affairs. They, that person will independently go and interview the person and maybe other family members to make sure you're who you say you are and you have their best interest in heart, at heart. You also have to go through the process of being bonded. Um, so it's if, if someone has family members that they would trust to handle their affairs, to look out for them, both their health care or their finances, it's much better if they will go the route of getting a durable power of attorney. One thing that people don't think about is once you have a child that reaches the age of 18, so they're not a child anymore, they're an adult, the parent cannot get information like from from banks or from hospitals. If, if their college student is in a car wreck and someone needs to go in and make some medical decisions, it's going to take a lot longer for the hospital to talk with them if they go in just maybe with the birth certificate versus if they go in with a durable power of attorney that covers both health care and financial. You can have a document that covers the health care separately and, and their advanced directive documents that are available on the Tennessee.gov website for well, that. That just triggered a bunch of thoughts for me. They're giving me the signal again and telling me we got to take a break. But when we return, we're going to finish our discussion with Miss Lorinda Ingram. So please stay tuned. One of the things that sets us apart from um, other schools or other productions that are doing this is that our kids are 100% in charge of what they're doing. We sell the ads, we build the stage, we make the costumes. Working in this uh, environment, I've learned to appreciate everything that's given to me because not many high schools have programs like this. When I first started in this program, my first musical was Hairspray. And now, four years later, I'm in my last musical, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And looking back, I think I've progressed a lot. To see them now as seniors and to see the people that they have become it's changed me more than um, more than I think it's changed them.
For more information about the Kappa program, visit GHSKappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Thank you for joining us on Let's Talk Money. Today we are honored to have with us Lorinda Ingram, who's Director of Tax Services and Estate Services with Reynolds Bone and Greasebeck. So with just a little time left, we're going to jump back into our discussion with Lorinda. We were talking just a few minutes ago about the situation that brought you into the industry mm -hmm. um, with your family member and that there had not been planning done. Right. Um, and we talked about durable power of attorney, which is the, the, the document that gives you the authority to handle somebody's affairs mm -hmm. when they can't. And you mentioned conservatorship, which I know is a nightmare. Um, so if our viewers are listening and they think, oh no, I've got a kid in college and I know I can't get their grades, but if something happened, I don't want to I want to be able to help them if they're in the hospital, or I want to plan for my estate. What would be the what would be the documents that they would need to do? What what would be the steps you'd advise them to take? Well, um, I, I would recommend that they talk with an attorney, with with a with a Tennessee licensed attorney if they're a Tennessee resident, if they're a Mississippi resident, a Mississippi attorney. Um, they those documents usually don't cost a whole lot. Um, they're fairly standard. Um, there may be some things that the person would want in it. Uh, some people are really apprehensive about giving someone the authority to go in and look at their affairs or whatever. So sometimes they'll put in a provision, it's called a springing provision. And it basically doesn't, the document doesn't spring into action until that person has been like declared incompetent or Maybe if it maybe it only applies when they're overseas, or if it's a military member, maybe when they're deployed. So, there's some springing action. The mo the one we see most frequently is when someone is incompetent. Say someone you know has dementia or Alzheimer's or has had a stroke or in a car wreck. Well, if someone's laying there in a hospital bed in a coma or they can't talk, then that's obviously an incapacity at least at that moment. So, if someone's apprehensive, there are there are things that can be in the document to put their mind at ease. An another main um, document, fairly standard document, is a living will that tells what you would want done if you're brain dead or if you cannot eat on your own or, you know, things like that. Um, it, it makes a lot of people feel better knowing I've gotten this taken care of. I'm not going to stress out my family members wondering what I would have wanted, I'm able to put that in writing what I want. Another basic document is a will. Now if someone doesn't have a will, there are whatever state they're a resident of, there are laws on the books of that state that will say who gets their property at their death. Uh, spouse usually gets a percentage, children may get a percentage, but it, but it will tell, or even if someone didn't have children, it would tell you know, do siblings get it or whatever. So there's a mechanism, it's called intestacy, if someone dies without a valid will. Um, but a will will help them feel like they're in control. What I've seen is the people that seem to be most reluctant to do a will are people that have young children. And they are, a lot of times are at a dilemma on who would I name in my will to be guardian. And sometimes that can that can make them delay, un, you know, unduly putting a will in place, which, I mean, and that's a hard decision. But they can always change their will. They can either change the whole will or they can uh, use a document called a codicil to change that. Well, it's interesting you talk about no will and the dying, you know, intestate. I always tell people if you don't have a document, close your eyes and imagine the people that would step forward to handle your financial affairs, take care of you, make life decisions, take care of your children, now decide who you want that to be so that those people are not the ones handling it. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people think, oh my word, it could be this relative or this child and they're not capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. so. Or maybe they're capable, but maybe you don't want to put the stress on them. You might even want to name a corporate trustee mm -hmm. to, to serve as that to serve in that role, just to take a burden off them in a stressful time. Yeah. 
Good point. Um, another thing that, that we hear a lot about um, is called uh, living trust. Um, some people use those in places of wills. What I, what I see a lot is that not all assets get transferred, the ownership transferred into a living trust. So even, it, you know, it might be unclaimed property that surfaces later, and if it's sizable enough, they might still have to go to probate to deal with property that did not get retitled into the name of a living trust. Typically, when someone has a living trust, they'll have a very short will that just says, anything that I didn't get around to transferring into my living trust, I now leave to my living trust. Right. Lorena, talking about trust, uh, I understand Tennessee is one of the few uh, uh, states where you can have a uh, community property trust. Can you yes. explain what that is and, and how it might be beneficial? Well, basically a community property trust, um, there, it, what they do is for property that is placed in that trust, um, and, and what you have is a couple, married couple, that put property in a trust, and it works as if that couple lived in a community property state just for property that has been retitled in that trust. The advantage, and this gets back to the income tax planning, the, the advantage for that is that at the first spouse's death, all property in that trust gets a step up in tax basis to the fair market value at the date of that first spouse's death. That is huge. That, yeah. that can be very huge. And if, you, if you didn't have it in that community property trust, how would, how would it work? Only the property that was owned by the person that passed away I would see. get the step up. So it's a big advantage. Could be a very big advantage. Yeah. Well, we've just got one minute left. So if there's anything you would like to tell our viewers, any last last bit of advice? Um, I think my last bit of advice would probably be that everyone has a mental block about something. And if your mental block is about taxes, or if it's about estate planning or doing a will, you're not alone in the boat. There are a lot of people that have a mental block on that. And don't ever be embarrassed about going to someone for help because they have seen people in worse situations than what you are in. So I, I think that would be my, my main piece of advice is you're not alone. Everybody has a mental block about something and if yours happens to be taxes or estate planning, we can help you. <laughs> well, that is, that's great advice. Thank you so much for being on our well, show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been, it's been fabulous. Um, if any of our guests, um, or any of our viewers rather, would like more information about today's show, they can visit us on our website at ghstv.org, where we're streaming live 24 hours a day. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We hope you've enjoyed our show, and we hope you will join us next month on Let's Talk Money.